Blessed, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked will perish. What number are you singing? 291. 6 Luke chapter 6 and we'll read verses 17 through 26 And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. 
and all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Father in heaven, we are we are so grateful to, to know that you love each and every one of us, that we can come to you as we are, and that you will give us rest, you will give us hope, you will heal our broken hearts and give us something to look forward to. And Lord, as we consider these, these words in Scripture and as we reflect on who you are and who we are in you, we ask that your Spirit will teach us and guide us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we joined Jesus and the, and the future disciples at that time on the shore of the sea. They had just worked all night doing the things that they did best, fish. I found it interesting that the way Jesus got Peter's attention was, not, was through Peter's own strengths, not his weaknesses. Peter was a master of his trade. He knew what to do, and he knew when to, to go out and where to go when he went out. If you were to speak to someone that does a great deal of fishing, which isn't me, they know fish. They have specific places that they go depending on the weather. They have particular tools that they use in specific places. And if you were to use something other than what they use, they'd probably laugh at you. Which is one of the reasons why I don't fish that much. I don't know those things. And I'll put something crazy on there and, and wonder why I'm not getting any fish. This is why last, last week's story is so remarkable. We get a glimpse into the reality of the humanity of Simon Peter and that of Jesus. We saw that Peter had respect for Jesus because he, he didn't think twice about putting out his boat to allow Jesus to teach more effectively. Peter knew Jesus as a teacher. He respected him as a teacher, and rightfully so because, the prior, because prior to that day, possibly the very day before, Jesus had provided relief to Peter's mother-in-law's illness. But when Peter began to encroach on Peter's turf, or when Jesus began to encroach on Peter's turf, we see something different. Jesus suggested that they row out into the deep and to cast their nets out one more time. And Peter pipes up and says, wait right there, Jesus. We've been out all night and caught nothing. You're being ridiculous. But because it's you, we will humor you just this once. That, of course, is my own par personal paraphrase. Please don't quote that. It's not an authoritative translation. But that's the sense of what's going on. Peter looks at Jesus, who's speaking to Peter's strength, and he's saying, what are you talking about? Peter. 
Peter didn't want to trust Jesus in that area because in this instant, Peter was the authority, not Jesus. We all know that Jesus showed Peter something that day. Peter was shown that that everyone has room for improvement. Just when we think we know everything, we we find out that there's so much more to learn. And that's why I love studying scripture or doing Bible studies. There's not a day that goes by where I don't learn something that I didn't know before. Every year, scholars publish papers and articles and books that investigate various aspects of grammar and the usage of particular words within ancient writings, and suddenly everything on that page becomes vibrant again. There's always more to learn. We need to keep learning, to to learn and, and to keep our minds active. When we stop learning, we, when we cease filling our minds with new knowledge, we begin to notice something. We notice that our brains have a leak. It is a leak that's always been there. We have all forgotten things along the way, but when we stop filling our mind with new learning, our brains seem to lose the ability to retain information. Of course, there's exceptions to that. There's, there's, there's exceptions and there's pathogens that, ca- that can affect this. But overall, those that continue to learn have less trouble adapting to change than those that stop learning. P- Peter thought that he was a master of his trade. People might have even come to him for advice. He might have been the man that fathers would send their children to to learn the newer methods within that trade. Peter thought he knew his business. When Jesus filled his nets, Peter was struck with the reality that is often hard to swallow. He was not that exceptional. I repeat this story because today we meet Jesus and the disciples in a similar place. When we read through the scriptures, we recognize two major sermons from Jesus. They are often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. These two sermons are are very similar, but there are some discrepancies as well. The first discrepancy is is the location, or, or probably more accurately, the orientation. In one, Jesus is on the mount, and the other, he's on the plain. You know... One, he's above the people, and the other, he's speaking up to the people. So even though the content of the message is similar, we're led to believe that Jesus presented these ideas at a couple of different times. I would venture to say that Jesus probably gave a similar sermon some, a sermon similar to this multiple times, because Probably every time he spoke, he spoke something similar to this. I say this because that's what pastors do. We kind of get into a rhythm. There are, there are key points that we find that we find as eternally important. So we weave them into nearly every sermon that we preach. You've probably noticed that in my own messages. I often repeat the holy rhythm of Jesus' life that he made it his custom to worship with the community in the synagogues, that he withdrew often to pray in isolated places, and that he ministered to the needs of those within the community. I say that almost every week because I think it's important. There aren't many weeks that I, that I do not mention that, and I mention it because I believe that the when the disciples spoke about living a life of the the life of christ or putting on christ that's what they're talking about i see the witness of scripture and and the very lifestyle of jesus that the that jesus and the apostles are calling us to live to be a disciple of a teacher literally means that we practice their disciplines I want us all to know the disciplines of Jesus. I want us all to be friends of Jesus and to be his disciples. So as I prepare and present messages, 
I do whatever, whatever I can to remind us of what that lifestyle is. Worship, prayer, and ministry. Jesus was a great orator. He had an ability to use the spoken word to cause people to think, think deeper and to change their minds. One common commentary writer says, Power often divides, and great power easily, almost invariably, becomes, becomes coercive. The magnetism of Jesus' unconditional love is a power that unites, however, drawing people into fellowship with himself. Isn't that a great way to look at things? When Jesus speaks, he doesn't speak like the great leaders of this world. So many of the leaders of this world look only to, to giving themselves or their group more power and influence. Jesus takes a different route, a route that many of us might miss, a route that we often overlook because all too often we get distracted by the systems of our world. Jesus walks with his various disciples out to this level place, a plain. We're not told exactly where this plain is, but we know that, that they are still in Galilee. If I were to make an educated guess, I'm guessing that Jesus is most likely in the very place outside of Capernaum where last week's sign with the fish occurred. And I say this because there would be a level place where the entire community of fishermen could lay out their nets and to let them dry and where they could clean and repair those nets in a level place. This crowd gathers. They know <clears throat> that this community and that these men are from Capernaum and, have become, and, and that Capernaum has, has become the central location that Jesus travels from. And they come to listen to what he has to say. People have come from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and even from Tyre and Sidon. We may not recognize the importance at first glance of these places, but they are important. They are in Galilee, which is not mentioned. And that's kind of weird, but they're not mentioned because it would make sense that the people from the surrounding area would be, be there. Because this is shortly after Jesus began his ministry. Jesus remained in Galilee. He has only recently gathered the disciples that he will invest the most time with. His ministry is still a local thing, only within the area around the sea. Yet people have heard of his work. People from Judea have traveled to listen to him. People from the capital city, the, the seat of the temple, left their sacred, sacred grounds to listen to Jesus speak. And people from Tyre and Sidon are there. That's probably one of the most important things. A couple of weeks ago I mentioned that the people of Nazareth sought to kill Jesus, and the reason that they were upset was because he didn't condemn the people outside of the nation of Israel. He included the Gentiles with the people of promise in the blessing that the Messiah would bring. Titan, or Tyre and Sidon, I keep getting those mixed up. We'll just have to go with it. They're cities of the Gentiles. We might be, there, there might be Hebrews that live within those areas, but by and large, these people, the people of these cities are largely influenced by the Gentile worldviews. All these people, the locals, the elites from the capital, the people outside of the religious community are gathered on this plane to listen to what Jesus has to say. Early in his ministry, the doors to the nations were opened and they were coming to the one true God. Jesus moves out into this open space and he stops and he lifts his eyes to his disciples. This is, too is important. The people gathered here are not merely curious. These are the people that have moved, in some sort, moved into some sort of belief. These people look at Jesus 
as a teacher worthy not only to listen to, but to follow. To be called a disciple means that you have taken on that lifestyle of a particular teacher. Jesus is not addressing a curious crowd, trying to decide what they want to believe. These people, at this moment, believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed leader that they have been waiting for. They believe this because the power and the authority that Jesus has already exhibited Jesus has already fulfilled the, the very things that he proclaimed in the first sermon that, that Luke recorded. And he lifts his eyes to his disciples. And as he lifts his head in this manner, a hush settles on the crowd. And they look towards Jesus in expectancy, eager to hear the words that he will say. And he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. This first statement is probably the most important part of this entire section, because everything hinges on what is defined in this, in this one statement. Blessed are you who are poor. The word poor is one of those loaded words that has multiple meanings in a wide context. Often we look at this word from our own cultural perspective. And because of this, we misunderstand and often misuse what Jesus is saying. We think of the poor today. As we think of the poor today, several things may come into mind. In ancient cultures, this was not always the case. Our definition of poor isn't exactly what they may have thought it was. Often we reread this story and, and the, the story of Robin Hood comes to, to mind. Robbing from the rich to give to the poor. And we often think of this, that story as a, a great story of wealth redistrib redistribution. Those of us that are more social justice minds, ha that have a more social justice mindset might think that we should continue this practice. I'm not saying that your ideas are wrong. I'm suggesting that there's more to it. The poor then, like today, are those without means. They are the people that live in poverty. They live, as some might say, hand to mouth, meaning they work for their daily bread. They're not making plans of their financial future because everything that they make today will be going directly to feeding them or providing shelter for their family. This is part of the story, but it's not the whole story that's told in Scripture. Nor is it the whole story told in Robin Hood. When we look deeper, at, look at the word deeper, and if we look at the, the words that are opposite, that are associated with the usage of this word, they found that, that the antonym, or the opposite of poor, is not rich, as we might say or might think, but the opposite is violent. So Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor. And yes, he says, woe to the rich, but, but it actually is woe to the violent. I want us to think about that for a moment. Jesus is not blessing, not saying blessed are the poor because they live in poverty but because they are living under threat. They are persecuted. They are living in a state of need, not because of anything that they have done, but because of what's going on around them. People are forcing them to live that way, forcing them in some manner. In many ancient cultures, there is not a real concept of the middle class. Those that... There, there were those that were governed and those that were lorded over. Or governors and lorded over. In ancient Rome, they did have a merchant class. The class that we would more closely associate with our modern understanding of a middle class. But this merchant class was feared because they were not always living under the same rules. So they feared the, the merchant class. 
because they weren't controlled. It's easier, easier on the government to have everyone in a servant class because they can rule them. And that is why Robin Hood has been such a literary success because it speaks not only of rich and poor, but oppressed and the oppressor. Blessed are you who are aware of your own poverty, aware of your own needs. Blessed are you that understand that you cannot provide or do everything by yourself. Not be, because yours is the kingdom of God. Those that recognize that they cannot do everything for themselves are required just to survive, to work with those around them. They are required to make peace with their neighbors because if they do not work together, how are they going to survive? This is something that we often misunderstand, especially in a culture where we, where we think and pride ourselves on our self-sufficiency. But even in the systems of capitalism, these rules apply. Those that recognize their need will be more successful. A business needs their employees, and they need their customers. They need their suppliers, and they need their di distributors. Our current labor shortage is a testimony to the dynamic relationship of the poor and the rich. Not because of wealth, necessarily, but because that relationship between those, the, the various needs within a community. When a business does not recognize their own needs or the needs of those that serve, that they serve or th that serve them, we have problems. Problems that reach well beyond the paycheck. The poor are those in need, and we are all in need. It doesn't matter if you live in the United States or in Panama, we are all in need. When I was in Ukraine 22 years ago, we were advised never to speak of the amount of money that we made. This advice was given because if you speak of those things out of context, it can be misleading. I made at the time $10 an hour and, and that to most Ukrainians sounded like a fortune and it would be in Ukraine. But when I speak of it in context, things change. How many hours did I have to work to go to a movie? How many hours did I have to work to provide one meal? How many hours did I have to work to take my girlfriend on a date? That's kind of a, a joke there because I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. So I didn't go on dates. I just went to the movies alone. These things were very similar between Ukraine and the United States. Both of us had to work approximately two hours to buy a ticket to see a movie. Both of us would have to work all week to be able to afford to go on a date. Both of us would have to work the same amount to provide the basic needs of life because wealth is contextual. Everyone needs. But like I said, this is not necessarily speaking about our purchasing power, but it's speaking about it, but it's connected to the use of violence. The poor are blessed because they live in a world system where they have no voice. They are oppressed and they live in a system where they are at the mercy of others. When Robin Hood is stealing from the rich in that great story during the feudal age, He's stealing from those that rule over the people. He's stealing from the government and returning the taxes to those that were forced to pay. We often look at that story as a champion of socialism, but we could also look, for, look at it from a completely opposite perspective. We can do this because rich and poor are not necessarily about currency. It is a relationship between those that need and those that can, can provide for those needs. Jesus goes on and he says, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. This first woe is similar to the first blessing. 
because they, the woes like the blessings, hinge on each other. Woe to the rich because they, not because they're rich, but because they are unaware of their own needs. They are, the rich have lost sight. They have forgotten that they, they have forgotten that they do not hunger because they have much. But why do they have more than those that are in need? This is where things get a bit dicey. This is why violence is the antonym for poor and not necessarily rich. The rich are the ones that are in control of society. They are the ones that provide jobs. They are the ones that can control the government agencies. They are the world's leaders. This is no different today. This is no different because very rarely does a working class person get elected to any significant seat in government. They are not elected because it costs too much to get their name out to that election, the body of electors. It is the rich that rule the world. Woe to the rich, because they can do, can so easily be blinded to their own needs. They can be blinded to the needs of those that are providing them with the very things that they enjoy. Without each and every one of us, the owners of Amazon and Google would not be able to live their lives of luxury. Without, without us, our president would not have been elected, even though we may not have voted for him. Without us, the rich could not live the lifestyles that they enjoy. This is why Jesus says, Woe to the rich. Woe to them when they look at the bottom line and make choices that threaten the safety of their customers or their employees. Woe to them when they fail to recognize that those on the production line are just as valuable as those that sit in the corporate office seats. Woe to them that forget that they have an important place in this world, not because they are rich, but because they are the conduit through which society thrives. And when the rich forget who they serve and who serves them, they become oppressors. They are often the cause of their own downfall. Woe to the rich. But again, this is not about wealth. Jesus goes on and he says, Blessed are the hungry, for you will be satisfied. And woe to you that are full now, for you shall be hungry. These are examples of the relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor, the rich and the poor. How many of us have left a church potluck hun hungry? We haven't had one in a while, so you probably left hungry recently. But if you have left hungry, it's your own fault. It's not the fault of the church because there's plenty to eat. There has to be a healthy balance within a community. Or when there's a healthy balance within a community, there isn't need. Because everyone's doing their part and they're taking care of each other. This doesn't mean that everyone is, has complete equality. It simply means that there's a balance. When Jesus looks at his disciples, he's not giving them philosophical ideas. He's telling them, that this is what is expected of my disciples. If you have enough to eat, make sure your neighbor does too. If you do not have enough to eat, talk to your community and make sure that they are aware of what you need. And see if you can figure something out together. But do not make assumptions. We all have needs and we do not always know what the, the needs of someone else is. We can't judge them, but we must live together within our communities. To be a disciple of Christ, to be a friend of Jesus, we must take on his lifestyle. We must die to ourselves and live for the kingdom. And what that means is that we have to be honest with each other. We need to stop with petty jealousy. We need to stop with 
with living in envy and greed. Instead, we need to love God with all that we are and all that we have and love our neighbor as ourselves. Each of us are important. Each of us have a role within our family and within our community. Every person in, within this meeting house plays an important role in the kingdom of God. Some of us might stand and speak or, or sing, and some of you may think that you have nothing to offer, but you do. A couple of months ago, I stood up here at the close of worship, and I watched the youngest person in attendance that day come up and stand next to the oldest member of our, our congregation. Everything in, in the world that, that is used to divide us was present on, at that moment. Yet that child's actions spoke more than every word that I uttered. Because that child knew what it was to be in the kingdom. It was the first time that that child came to worship with us. And, and that child taught me the meaning of everything about the kingdom. The kingdom is for us all. And those that live in the kingdom love God and they embrace the Holy Spirit and they live the love of Christ with others. Jesus says, blessed are the poor because they understand their need. And woe to the rich because they fail to see the needs that they have. So as we join with each other in this time of holy expectancy, let us reflect not, on, not on, on who we are on the spectrum of wealth and poverty or where we're at on that spectrum, but let us instead reflect on our community. How are we showing the person next to you that they are loved by God? How are we showing the person that brings the food to our table at a restaurant that they are loved by God. Do the children, do your children know before they go to bed tonight that they are loved and that they are important to you and into this community? Blessed are the poor. And may we understand that who we are and that we are rich in God's mercy and that we can share that with those in need. Let us now join together in, in this time of holy expectancy and open worship and communion in the manner of friends. <clears throat> and if the Spirit is speaking to you, then please share with us. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and Lord, I pray that we will ask forgiveness for the times that we've used our influence without thinking of how that would work in our larger community. Lord, we pray that you will guide us to become conduits of peace and of hope so that those around us will be fed and will not have to struggle under oppression. Lord, I pray that we will see our need and the needs of those around us and that we will be filled with mercy because we all need you 
and we all need each other. And in your name we pray. Amen. God, you root those who trust in you by streams of healing water. Release us from the bonds of disease, free us from the power of evil, and turn us from the falsehood and illusion that we may find the blessing of new life in you through the power of Christ. Amen. 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 Go in peace.